databases are domain specific and excel in certain scenarios. You can find in-memory databases, graph databases, document stores, and more. It's becoming more and more common to run many of these in your stack. The difference in interfacing with these databases can add complexity to your application, so it's important to have the right abstractions in place. Marcos Almanacid, an open source developer in Erlanger at Tanaka, will describe a tool he's built called SumoDB, designed to simplify interacting with a variety of databases. Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, this talk is about SumoDB, which is an Erlang persistent layer designed to be easily used in your Erlang applications. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, okay. Here we go. Uh, my name is Marcos Almonacid. I'm from Argentina. I study computer science at the Universidad Tecnológica Nacional in Argentina, too. I've been working on an application for about three years now. Before that, I worked mostly on Ruby apps. And currently, I am developer at Inaka, where I have worked on some really cool applications like Whisper. Maybe you know it. Uh, Inaka is a US company with offices in Argentina. We have quite a large team of Erlangers. Um, we build end-to-end -end applications, mainly with Erlang, Ruby, iOS, and Android. Um, we also do Erlang consulting. Okay, let's get started. Here, we are seeing a 100 call statement extracted from a very big shen server. I call this, this shen server the God module. Uh, the goal of this code is to execute a select query in the database and return the result. Uh, how many of you have written a got module with functions like this one to access your databases? Okay, one, two, okay. This is like the first natural thing to do to, to communicate with the databases. Inside this function, uh, we have a hard code query and we are executing it by using some DB driver in MySQL in this case. And, and also we are handling different types of results, even the, even the errors. Uh, but this way actually tends to make creepy project because there's no clear definition of concerns and responsibilities, and our business logic is mixed with the database implementation details. Also, it makes the application harder to test without running the whole system, and we can't, we can't test the, the business logic isolated from the access layer, from the, access, from the data access layer, sorry. Also, it has a lot of duplicated code since we are copy-pasting uh, code to create new handle call statement to create new queries. And uh, for the same reason, it's tedious to scale and refactor and it's very easy to make a mistake. And this is a snippet of the GOT module. Uh, here, we only have four functions for this GOT module and the code doesn't fit in the slide. As you can see, it's an excellent nightmare to work with this code. So let's, say, let's see how SumoDB can help us to write this in a cleaner way. With SumoDB, we only need one line of code to do most of the common queries. We can do a lot of things with just one line in Sumo, like persisting and deleting an entity, such as user, messages, etc. And we can fetch by conditions, paginate results, and also we can create a schema for each one of our, of our ent entities. So let's see how Sumo is about, how it works, and why it, and why it is interesting. The secret is just a pattern, repositories. How many of you are familiar with this pattern? Okay, someone, okay. To try to understand what repositories, what repositories are, let's go back uh, to the gold module for, for a bit. In the slide, uh, we can see its responsibilities. The first thing that we notice in, in that, uh, in, the, in the slide, it, does, it, it, that it has a lot of, of responsibilities, and also, it has uh, handle, it handle multiple entities. That's bad. So let's split each entity on its own module. I mean, one module, one entity. This sounds like Active Record, right? How many of you have used Active Record here? In Ruby, in Ruby for example. Okay. With Active Record, instead of one big God module, we will have several modules uh, and one per entity. It's a first improvement for this, this situation, but it's still a mess because we still have a lot of mini-god modules. Uh, the code is still coupled to the database details. 
So let's go one step further. Um, let's take each entity and let's start splitting its responsibilities into new modules. The first module will be a domain entity, which encapsulates the business logic and the state for the entity. This domain entity, this module, uh, knows nothing about the storage details. Then we will have our repository, uh, which is the layer that translates back and forth the representation of the entity into something that the database can use. And also the repository stores SQL code, uh, like custom selector and deleters. And finally, there's a, there's, there's a layer that actually knows how to talk to a database. And those are the storage backends. Oh, it's, it's all the slides, sorry. Um, the storage backends are just a convenient layer to encapsulate the different DB drivers so that no one else knows how about them. Um, in sumo, these three concepts are implemented with behaviors. The domain entity in SumoDB are just modules that implement the sumo doc behavior. This behavior uh, only needs three callbacks, sumo schema, sumo sleep, and sumo wake up. Let's take a look. Sumo schema is used to create the entity schema in the database. In it, we uh, construct the schema that Sumo needs to create, the, to create it in the DB. To help with that, Sumo provides two convenient functions, uh, which are new schema and new field. Then we have the Sumo sleep uh, callback, the, which one will we call when we want to persist the entity in the, in the database. Sumo DB uses this function to translate our state representation into a prob list, which is the internal uh, representation in Sumo. In this case, we are translating for a record, which is a user record, to the prob list. And when Sumo loads an entity from the DB, it will use Sumo Wake Up to translate the entity from the prob list to our representation, which is a record. Here we are receiving a prob list, and we are returning the user record. So, Let's see how the workflow looks like for the persist and find by operations. When we call, when we call the persist function, sumo db will use the sumo sleep callback to translate the state representation for, for the entity to a prob list. And then it will convert this prob list to whatever the database driver needs. The exact opposite happens when we fetch an entity from the database. The database representation is taken and transformed into our own state representation by the, sumo, by the function sumo wake up. The point here is that we only need to implement the sleep and, and wake up functions, and the rest of the work is made by sumo db. Okay, that's all about the domain entities. Repositories, repositories. The repositories know about, know about queries and how to work with the different storage backends, and it will also translate the information back and forth from the domain entity to the storage backends. Uh, this really helps to minimize the query logic duplication. So the idea is that our domain entities can focus on the business logic and it, it will delegate the storage details to someone else, to the repositories. By default, Sumo comes, comes with uh, um, basic implementation for different repositories like MySQL and MongoDB. And these repositories already have the implementation for, uh, of functions such as persist, delete, delete by, find by, etc. Usually, you will use one of these default repositories. And if you need some special query to execute in your application, you can use these default repositories as the foundation for your own, where you will write your new queries. For example, or it's not supported in find by clauses, clauses yet. Uh, so if you need a query with an or in it, you should, you should write your own function in your own repository. It's simple to do that. Okay, now we have the storage backend. Uh, the storage backend are modules that implement the Sumo backend behavior. They encapsulate and know how to use the database driver, such as in MySQL. And also, it starts the connection with the database and provide this connection to the different repositories. As a bonus, uh, SumoDB is capable of dispatching events that affect the state of the domain. 
like notifying that a certain entity was created, updated, or deleted. Also, it will notify when a schema was created for any entity. This is useful to react, up, uh, to react upon the events coming on from the domain, from the domain and dispatching other kind of events. For instance, into a rabbit MQ system or doing cleanup tasks, etc. cetera. Uh, this is implemented using chain event, which is the standard OTP way to do it. Uh, sorry. So how, we can, how do we use SumoDB in our system? Well, let's say we want to work with an entity called user, and let's see what we need to do to implement it with SumoDB. The first thing to do is, uh, is to write the entity module, where we add the sumo dog behavior and its state representation. In this case, it's a user record with only an ID and a username field. And then we implement the three callbacks that we mentioned before, sumo schema to create the schema in the database uh, with the two fields, ID and username. We can add some options like actual increment or not null, etc. And then we have the sumo, uh, sumo sleep and sumo wake up functions to translate the, from the user record to the properties, and vice versa. And also, we, can, we could implement a constructor function. Uh, we could do it, but it's not necessary. It's not, it's not necessary. Here we have it. And the next step is the configuration. The first thing uh, that we do is bind our entity user to a repository, a repository called user repo. Then we tie that repository name to the module that has the implementation. In this case, it's sumo repo MySQL, which is one of the default repository that comes with uh, SumoDB. In addition, we add some options like the storage backend and the number of workers for this repository. And finally, we will configure the storage backend with a, a specific database uh, driver option, such as user, password, etc. And that's it, done. Now we can start to persist and find user in our system using SumoDB. For instance, we could have a user service with functions like new, get, and delete, and it, this function only have one or two lines to do your work, to do its works. Very simple. So, sorry. Let's do another step and let's see how we can combine SumoDB with Cowboy to have an HTTP server with a storage backend in a few lines. Uh, for that, we will explore the Kanishita app, which is a sample application created, created by Naka to teach Erlang to the newcomers. Kanishita means paper boy in Spanish. <laughs> uh, it's a simple RESTful server with server sending event capabilities and it basically receives, stores, and dispatches new flashes. It has two endpoints, one to publish new flashes and another one to receive them. And we have Cowboy to talk with the users and we have SumoDB to talk with the database. In this case, we are using MySQL. With the get endpoint, uh, we can start listening for new flashes from the server. When the communication starts, the server will retrieve all the new flashes from the DB and it will keep the connection open. Then with the post uh, request, we will send a new flash to the server and it will store the new flash in MySQL using SumoDB. And also it will send the new flash to the open end connections. Let's see the main, um, here we have the, the new event that we added with the post uh, endpoint. Okay, let's see the main part of the Kanishita's code. Kanishita has only one sumo doc, which is Kanishita News. In it, we can see uh, the sumo doc behavior declaration and the new flash record, which is the state representation for this entity. Uh, also, we can see the sumo schema function where Kanishita defines the table for this entity. And below, we have the sumo sleep and sumo wake up function where the first one translates a new flash uh, to a prop list and the other one translate in the opposite way. Then we have a constructor function which receives two fields and returns a new flash record. And finally, we have three convenient getter functions. And 
And here we have the cowboy handle functions. In the handle post, uh, Kanjita used the sumo persist function to save the new flash in the database with only one line. Well, actually, we have the new hit there. And with the handle in the, get, in the handle get, Kanishita calls uh, to sumo find all to get all the stored new flashes. Very simple. With only one line, we are calling to the database and getting all the new flashes. Very simple. So with two slides, uh, I showed you an, a whole application that really works. It's very simple. Okay, the current state for uh, for SumoDB is uh, is, a, is the next one. SumoDB now supports MySQL and MongoDB very well. Actually, we have a big project working with Sumo and MySQL, and it works really, really great. Uh, we have almost finished the support for Redis and SQL3, and the next uh, in the future we want to add Amnesia and ETS and also DynamoDB, and also we are thinking uh, uh, to work on ES3, and ES3, sorry, um, that's pretty much it. Okay, to finish this talk, I want to see that Sumo was born from our need to find a way to write fast and clean code to access databases, and since we couldn't find any application to do that in the pure Erlang world, we decided to create it. Uh, Sumo is a young project, it does, it works pretty well, and we want it to grow up. It's an open source project, so, so you are invited to contribute. SumoDB is our new way to work in Erlang, and it can be yours too. Thank you. It was really small, I know. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Uh, actually, we created it because we need to work with MySQL, so the first uh, support uh, was for MySQL. It could be in the, in the list. It's not uh, really, um, it's, it's, it's in the list, but not yet. <laughs> we, work, we will work to, in, in that. Right. Just right, right. You, you don't need to use record to to represent your entity. You could use probabilities or whatever you want. It's not necessary. Maps. Maps, actually. Yeah. So, do you have any plans to connect different repository backends so you could have a user that's stored in MySQL that has some data in Redis and has associated files in S3 and make it easy to select across the different? Yeah, actually, you you could connect each repository with uh, one different uh, storage backend. So you could right now each entity only can work with one repository. So you we you can support multiple uh, databases, but one per entity. Right now, no, you you don't have. Right now, you can do you can work with multiple databases for the same entity, but you can implement different database, data, databases for uh, different entities. Yeah. 